So welcome everyone to today's CMCC webinar on Decadal Predictability of North Atlantic Blocky and the NAO. Today's speaker is Panos Atanasiadis. Panos uh, took his PhD in 2007 at Reading University with Dr. Ambaum, and then he moved to Washington University with Mike Wallace, and then afterwards to Athens University uh, for postdocs. And he joined CMCC in 2011, where he started to work in the Climate uh, Simulation and Prediction Division on seasonal and decadal predictability, including teleconnection, blockings, and JET. Today, he's going to present us some recent results uh, about the North Atlantic blocking and the NIO as part of his activities in the H2020 project Blue Action. Before we start, the webinar, I would like to say a few words about CMCC. Next slide, please. And the CMCC is the foundation whose mission is to investigate and model our climate system and its interaction with society, providing reliable, rigorous and timely scientific results to stimulate sustainable growth, to protect the environment and to develop science-driven adaptation and mitigation policies in a changing climate. Next slide, please. And CMCC uh, is, uh, is a network and it has different sites uh, dislocated in different cities in Italy, including Milano, Bologna, Venice, Viterbo, Capolice and Sassari. Next slide, please. And it is organized into research divisions uh, like advanced scientific computing, climate simulation and prediction, economic analysis of climate impacts and policy, impacts on agriculture, forest and ecosystem services, ocean modeling and data simulation, ocean prediction and application, risk assessment and adaptation strategies, regional models and geohydrological impacts, and sustainable earth modeling economics. Next slide, please. And considering the uh, theme of this division, the topics that uh, the foundation is involved in includes modeling, adaptation, policy, agriculture, society, prediction, simulation, ocean ecosystem, and so on. Next slide, please. And it has also different ways, MCC has also different ways or outreach, including scientific publication, but also events like this uh, webinar uh, cycle, and education, including summer and winter schools, as well as PhD programs. And it has different way of communication to, science, to the scientific public, but also to the general public in, a different, in different ways. Next slide, please. And uh, before we start, I just want to remind you that uh, at the end of Panos talk, we will have a Q&A session where you can raise your question to Panos using the questions menu provided by your GoToWebinar system. I will read the question and put them to, to Panos, who will answer. And um, you can write the questions at any time. So, we are now ready to start. And so, Panos, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Annalisa. Thank you all for uh, attending this uh, webinar. I should mention that uh, this uh, work uh, makes part of the CMCC contribution to the Blue Action Project. This is a webinar on uh, decadal predictability of the North Atlantic blocking and the NAO. And this is a work that uh, I have been doing in close collaboration with uh, Steve Yeager from NCAR, Yang Ocon from uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, and Alessio Bellucci and Stefano Tibaldi from CMCC. And uh, I have uh, prepared the slides to be as uh, much as uh, self-explanatory, but of course I'm here to guide you through the material and uh, answer uh, any questions in the end. I would like to mention first that, uh, as a brief introduction, that uh, the varying configuration of the North Atlantic jet and the associated storm track, referring to circulation regimes of the, in the Euro Atlantic domain, as defined, uh, for instance, uh, via clustering analysis, 
are directly related to or dependent upon the occurrence of blocking in different parts of the domain. Climatologically, as a large scale circulation anomaly, blocking strongly affects the intensity and distribution of weather extremes, such as cold spells, snowstorms, and heat waves. Therefore, uh, for us, uh, modeling and predicting changes in blocking at different time scales is of paramount importance for a wide range of uh, human activities and applications. Skillful predictions of blocking variability can be turned into useful information for policy making, risk management, and general planning, ultimately benefiting society. So coming to this relationship that I referred uh, before between the jet and blocking, for instance, we see that uh, when we have days of uh, south jet or north jet as defined in uh, Willings et al. in 2010, we have a very distinct, uh, distinct uh, blocking climatology. So when we have practically blocking in Greenland and Iceland, we have the jet displaced to the south, while when we have uh, blocking uh, occurring at this part of the North Atlantic domain, we have the eddy-driven jet displaced to the north. And there is also the case, uh, importantly, when we don't have blocking in this domain, that we have uh, another circulation regime, which is, uh, relates to the NAO positive phase. So this is uh, what we see at the bottom is from uh, error interim reanalysis. There are two areas, patches, if you like, of uh, high blocking frequency. One is over Iceland and Greenland, and the other one is uh, here over uh, Britain and Scandinavia. And I will uh, refer back to these uh, areas uh, later on. Of course, there are a number of studies that have assessed the impact of blocking on uh, European weather extremes. Here I have, picked up, uh, I have picked up this study, which focuses on the impacts of uh, precipitation and temperature. And for example, we see how the severity, of the return period of uh, weather events, of uh, weather extremes, uh, cold spells and dry spells depend on the blocking duration. So this is to say the obvious that uh, blocking uh, has, uh, is important for, uh, for Europe and uh, focusing in this, uh, in this area. The open questions for us uh, is if we accept that part of the multi-annual to decadal atmospheric variability in the North Atlantic is driven by the ocean, and given that current decadal hindcast uh, so high skill in predicting SST anomalies uh, forced by the ocean circulation, shouldn't there be some predictability uh, also for the atmosphere, we ask? For instance, uh, is the occurrence uh, frequency of the dominant uh, Euro-Atlantic circulation regimes referring to Greenland blocking, Eastern Atlantic blocking, or the absence of blocking in the, in the, in the domain. Are these uh, frequencies predictable beyond the seasonal time scale? And if yes, then what are the drivers and the limits of this predictability? And how many ensemble members are needed to explore this predictability? We will try to uh, answer some of these questions. And first, um, still in the introduction, I would like to mention that recently we have seen that there is um, significant predictability at the seasonal time scale for the NAO and blocking. This uh, figure comes from a multi-system analysis, but there are also other uh, studies uh, using a single uh, uh, prediction system. And um, I'm showing you another figure that provided, uh, this comes from Haken and Ryan et al. And this was a strong motivation for uh, doing this work. Here we see practically the, how the blocking frequency changes uh, significantly from decade to decade in the 20th century. And if we focus at these two decades, for example, we can see that the blocking frequency over Greenland and Iceland 
between the 60s and the 90s changes by a factor of four. So can we predict at least partly this uh, strong variability? Probably we are coming to close to the time that uh, decadal prediction uh, will become operational and uh, this is an interesting article that just uh, came out uh, this month uh, as a review article on uh, decadal predictions. I will move on uh, refer saying that the impacts of Greenland blocking are very significant and similar to the NAO. In particular, these impacts include a strong feedback to the ocean via surface heat fluxes and Ekman transport anomalies forced by changes in the wind pattern. And this was nicely demonstrated in a review article by Desher et al. in 2010. Here I'm showing you um, the impacts for temperature, precipitation, sensible heat and latent heat. And uh, coming to um, the skill that um, current uh, decadal prediction systems uh, show for SST, I'm showing you results. So this is one figure from uh, Yeager et al. Another recent article uh, documenting the skill for the CHESM uh, large ensemble simulations. So on the top row, uh, we have the skill at different linear ranges for the initialized uh, ensemble. Uh, the middle row shows the difference in the skill between these initialized uh, predictions and the um, persistence alone. And the bottom row shows the difference in the scale again between the initialized predictions um, and the uninitialized ensemble referred to as uh, CESM large ensemble simulations. So for our um, interest is, uh, is the North Atlantic and we can see that uh, part of the scale comes from the correctly realistically initializing the hint casts and another part of the skill, perhaps uh, half, uh, comes from model dynamics uh, because there is a significant difference referred to the uh, different color bars. So this, uh, this red here is about 0.4, which is half of 0.8. This comes from the model dynamics. So having this skill for SSTs, the question is whether uh, this translates to some skill in the atmosphere. In the recent years, uh, let's say in the last 20 years or so, there have been uh, a number of articles, a number of studies, here are just a few, uh, that investigate the role of the ocean in forcing low frequency beyond interannual atmospheric variability over the North Atlantic. And of course, this is a wide range of frequencies. So when we refer from interannual to decadal and multidecadal, these are very different time scales that probably involved uh, distinct physical forcing mechanisms. And here I would like to make a reference also to Woolings uh, et al. in 2015, an article in which they um, explore the different character of the NAO. Uh, at different time scales. So in this in this figure, which is from uh, an early study of Rodwell and uh, Rowell in 1999, uh, we see um, a positive uh, like NAO positive NAO positive like uh, response uh, forced uh, in an atmospheric model that is uh, driven that is um, forced by this triple uh, anomaly SST anomaly. This is, uh, of course, there are many other studies with uh, similar results. And I will move now to the presentation of um, our, uh, our work. To say first that we have used a unique data set. This is NCAR's uh, decadal prediction uh, large ensemble, uh, which has 40 members and arguably allows, uh, this large ensemble allows the atmospheric response to oceanic forcing to emerge 
from the inherently unpredictable internal atmospheric variability. Uh, we apply a two-dimensional blocking detection to daily geopotential heights, of course, from uh, each uh, individual member. And this, uh, the data set it, uh, has uh, 62 years, so we have the system is initialized uh, every year from 1954 to 2015, and each forecast uh, runs for 10 years from which we choose only the winter days uh, corresponding to the months December uh, to March. For the NAO, we use uh, and sample mean, uh, mean sea level monthly mean fields, and we assess the predictive skill uh, against the NCEP and core analysis via anomaly correlation coefficient. Uh, I should mention uh, that the statistical significance is thoroughly assessed, accounting for autocorrelation in the time series, which reduces the effective sample size. And we have applied uh, a one-sided t-test against the null hypothesis of non-positive uh, correlation. Here are some uh, details of the seasonal of the um, decadal prediction system. This uh, includes a CAM5 component uh, with a resolution of about one degree. And um, I think it's important to mention that uh, there are, I mean, the, the, the sample generation is uh, includes uh, small perturbations only in the atmospheric uh, initial conditions. This is a is a question whether in the in the future we will we would like to to assess what is the best uh, way to an, make an ensemble when you do seasonal forecasting or decadal forecasting. Uh, then we do the blocking detection in two dimensions using um, the two-dimensional extension of uh, the traditional Molteni-Tibaldi method. This is uh, from uh, Scherer et al. I'm following this, uh, this approach, this methodology that uh, searches for the inversal of the geopotential height gradient uh, to the south of, of a grid point and requires that there is a strong gradient to the north side. Uh, this, this way you can detect blockings of both of these types and we apply a, a threshold of uh, minimum persistence of five days. So moving on to see some of results from, uh, from this analysis. On the left, uh, we have uh, the reanalysis data from uh, results from the NCAR reanalysis. And on the right, uh, we have results from uh, CESM DPLE from the decadal predictions. And the top row is the climatological blocking frequency for winter, in which uh, we, have, we have identified these two boxes. Blocking in, in these two areas links to the circulation regimes, as I mentioned earlier, and we will use this, uh, these two areas for the rest of the study. And at the bottom row, we see the interannual variability of, of the blocking frequency. Probably you, you, have, you have noticed that there are the fields uh, from the decadal prediction system are much smoother, which is understood. Uh, if you consider that there are 40, we, we, we average 40 different realizations. But more importantly, we see that there is an underestimation uh, of blocking frequency, which is, I can say, a typical uh, bias in, in many models, in various models. Uh, we know this for CESM, for, for CAM5, uh, because we also use this atmospheric component at the CMCC climate model. So I will use this, initi uh, this uh, initials uh, that refer to Greenland and Iceland and Britain and Scandinavia. 
these are the first uh, results uh, from the analysis. Um, practically, we are showing the anomaly correlation coefficient uh, on the left. We are, we, I show results for the Greenland uh, Iceland uh, area and on the right for Britain and Scandinavia. So all the days of blocking uh, in these areas have been aggregated together, creating a, an index, a time series. And we, ass we assess the predictive skill for this time series. We have done this for every possible lead year range. So on, on this axis, we have the start lead year. And in, in the horizontal, we have the end lead year. So, for example, this, uh, this row here refers to lead year ranges 1 to 1, 1 to 2, 1 to 3, 1 to 4, and so on. And for Greenland and Iceland, we see that uh, there is uh, significant uh, scale, very high correlations uh, for cumulative ranges, uh, particularly the highest uh, anomaly correlation uh, is for the lead year range 1 to 8, and we have a correlation of 0 0.58. While for Britain and Scandinavia blocking the, the, the other area, we see that um, skill comes from uh, lead years 5 to 6, 5 to 8, uh, so not from the first years. And this is something that uh, still remains to be understood. Why the first years do not contribute to the skill, this there are possible uh, a number of possible explanations for this. I will mention just a couple of the of of, uh, of uh, cases. One is that this is a full value initialized initialized uh, system, so maybe the dynamics associated uh, with the model drift with the climate uh, drift uh, mask the skill in the first years while while the drift is strong. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that there is a, a delayed atmospheric response of some kind. And uh, later on, I will mention also another, a third possibility. We, we don't, honestly, we don't understand this completely, but so I just try to uh, consider what is uh, possible explanations for this. So, the markers, as you mentioned here, are uh, indicate uh, indicate that for these lead year ranges, the anomaly correlation coefficient uh, does not pass the the statistical significant test. So, for all other boxes that uh, have significant skill, we plot at the bottom row at the bottom plots the um, skill as a function of the ensemble size. So. The values that you see at the top plot correspond to the full ensemble for 40 members. But we see that the skill increases almost, uh, let's say, monotonically with ensemble size. And we see that the skill is not saturated at, uh, at 40 ensemble members, which uh, indicates that um, maybe we will benefit from even larger ensembles and at this point, I should mention that we there is a multi-system analysis which is ongoing. And uh, yes, one one another another detail is that uh, the gray lines here correspond to the lead year ranges that didn't have uh, significant skill, while the color lines correspond to uh, the lead year ranges with significant skill. Moving on, for these specific lead year ranges, lead year range 1 to 8 for Greenland and Iceland, and lead year range 6 to 7 for Britain and Scandinavia, we are plotting the skill uh, for every grid point. And we see that there is uh, there are coherent uh, patches of high skill for the areas uh, where there is significant uh, variability interannual variability of blocking if you 
if you remember um, these areas where the, 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 the blocking varies considerably, in those in these areas, we have a significant skill for these uh, linear ranges. Again, for the same linear ranges, which is one to eight for Greenland and Iceland blocking and six to seven years for Britain and Scandinavia, I saw here the respective time series. So the blue is for the observations from NCEP and NCAR and the dotted red is for the DPLE and sample mean. Between the two, we see the correlation that uh, we, we saw before, which is uh, almost 0 0.6 and uh, 0 0.43 for Britain and Scandinavia. And here we should, uh, we should, um, we should note that after applying a, a smoothing, some smoothing, we, we see that the correlations increase uh, significantly. And there is, a, there, is, there is a reason, there is a, there is a rational for doing this, uh, this smoothing. First, we need to understand why the, why the model time series, this, da, this dotted red looks more noisy than the observed time series. And quickly, I will, I, will, I will try to explain this. Here we are working with the Lydia range one to eight. So if we, if we focus at the observed time series and we take two consecutive years, the value of this point and this point are, are, are the results, these values are the result of um, averaging eight different uh, values, seven of which are identical for the observed time series. While this is not the case for, um, for the model time series, for the model time series, uh, two consecutive grid points um, come from completely different data. So there is, a, there is reason for applying some smoothing, which is the equivalent of averaging the, um, the forecasts of uh, a number of, of, of years. And for this reason, we now we better understand why these uh, time series are more noisy than, uh, than these time series, because here we only average two years instead of eight years. Coming to the point, we, we see that the correlation comes from the long time scale, so the multi-decadal time scale. Um, while for Britain and Scandinavia, we see that uh, some of the peaks at the decadal time scale are, um, are captured by, by the model prediction, by the decadal prediction system. Now, I would like to compare uh, results for the NAO and uh, blocking in Greenland and Iceland. And we see, very interestingly, I will say, that for the same lead year range, which is one to eight years, the NAO has a, a correlation coefficient, a skill, exhibits a skill which is almost identical to that for Greenland. And the same is the case after we do the smoothing that I mentioned. So we get correlations of uh, 0.85 for bo both for Greenland blocking and the NAO. And this is something that one will expect. You see that there is a high anti-correlation between uh, the Greenland blocking time series and the NAO time series. Mm -hmm. This uh, one, one more point that uh, it's interesting is that uh, this anti-correlation is um, can be seen. I haven't assessed it. I have I have not computed this anti-correlation, but you can see by eye that uh, it, it's the case both for the model time series and the observed time series. So we are trying to assess uh, how, uh, what drives this predictability. And one thing that uh, we have done is to take uh, composite differences of uh, SST fields for autumn and for years of uh, high 
and sample mean blocking in Greenland and years of low and sample mean uh, blocking. And we get this uh, pattern that indicates that when the SSTs are, are warmer or are higher in the subpolar gyre, we tend to have higher blocking over Greenland, which fits with uh, what we know from uh, a number of studies in, in, in the literature. And an interesting point also is that if we, instead of taking composite differences, if we look only at the, um, at the um, SST anomaly field for the high blocking and the low blocking years, we see that there is a high degree of uh, anti-symmetry. So the pattern is the same, it's just positive for uh, one case and negative for the other case. Then looking also for the Britain and Scandinavia uh, blocking, we see that the SST pattern coming out from, uh, from this uh, is largely orthogonal to, to this pattern. So the, the strong anomalies are found where the other pattern has weak anomalies. And this uh, makes us to think that there is some uh, connection between this, the blocking in the two areas. And one argument for this is quite straightforward. One could, understand, one could imagine that when there is higher blocking in Greenland, there is no room for high blocking also at the other uh, part of the domain because the domain is quite small and blocking is a very large scale phenomenon. So there should be some uh, anti-correlation between, between these two time series. And this is something that we are planning to assess uh, further. So it is an ongoing effort to pin down uh, the um, sources uh, of uh, the source of this predictability. Putting these results in a, in a, in a general, more general context, the decadal predictability found for the NAO and blocking over Greenland and Iceland um, may be understood as forced by oceanic dynamics, which need to be correctly initialized, referring to an AMOC uh, anomaly. And there have been studies, for example, Marshall et al. and Wills et al., another recent uh, study, among others, that have proposed relevant mechanisms to explain the coupled uh, ocean atmosphere um, multi-decadal variability in the Atlantic. Showing uh, this figure from uh, Wills et al, um, which provides um, a theoretical framework, we see that a multimodal positive NAO anomaly here, so this uh, indicated by the stronger winds, tends to strengthen the uh, the AMOC via buoyancy forcing induced by the surface fluxes. And this st st uh, stronger AMOC has, uh, brings a uh, regional heat advection that finally drives forces a positive uh, subpolar SST anomaly in this area. And this uh, is argued that this drives a negative NAO phase later on as seen here. If we see also uh, what uh, this study uh, says, practically we, it is shown that uh, subpolar SST anomalies in referring, referring to this area uh, can modulate, modulate the SST gradient at, the, at an important area, the storm track cyclogenesis region and consequently, this way, uh, there is an impact on storminess and the eddy-driven jet on the NAO and Greenland blocking. So this way, we, 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 this, this results, so these studies provide a, a theoretical framework for understanding this, uh, uh, the results that we discussed uh, before. There is also an ongoing um, there are ongoing sensitivity experiments in the framework of the Decadal Climate Prediction Project in which um, coupled models are forced by um, this uh, AMV-like uh, SST patterns. So there is also the flavor of, of forcing only with the 
tropical Atlantic or extratropical Atlantic SST anomalies trying to identify an atmos the atmospheric response. And here uh, I would like to mention uh, that uh, as suggested, for example, by Davini et al, uh, it has been suggested that maybe the tropical Atlantic anomalies are more relevant for the NAO-like response. Yet there is a strong indication against this proposal in the sense that uh, the uninitialized uh, simulations, the CESM lens, um, although have skill in equatorial Atlantic SSTs, they have no skill for Greenland and Iceland blocking and the NAO. So, closing, uh, this is uh, the last slide. We see that the statistically significant uh, predictive skill is found in a number of, uh, in a large ensemble of decadal hint casts for uh, wintertime NAO and North Atlantic blocking in various linear ranges. For Greenland and Iceland blocking, the highest skill is found for the linear range 1 to 8, and uh, at this linear range, the NAO exhibits comparable skill. And both of these correlations are boosted by uh, smoothing, the model time series, and these correlations arise uh, mainly from multi-decadal time scale. For Britain and Scandinavia blocking, uh, the highest skill, which is lower, is found for the Lydia range uh, 6 to 7, indicating either a delayed atmospheric response or a negative effect of the model climate drift uh, on its predictive skill during the first years of the forecast. Then mapping the skill revealed coherent patches of high skill in areas of uh, high interannual blocking variability. And we identified distinct SST patterns, largely orthogonal, uh, associated with the blocking anomalies in the two studied areas. And an assessment of the origin and the limits of this predictability is ongoing. Finally, uh, it is conceivable that thanks to the large and sample size of CESM DPLE, Predictive skill for the, atmosphere, for the atmospheric circulation at decadal time range could emerge for the first time. These uh, positive results call for A, assessing other aspects of atmospheric predictability in decadal hindcasts, B, performing a range of sensitivity experiments to identify the associated sources of predictability, and C, increasing further ensemble sizes and using multimodal ensembles to explore the predictability limits. So here are some references and I would like to thank you all for your attention. Uh, I will pass the microphone to um, Annalisa. Okay, thank you Panos for your very interesting talk. I just want to remind you that now we are going to have um, a Q&A session. So please, if you have questions for panels, write down them in the questions menu that you see in your GoToWebinar system. So we'll be able to um, read them and pose them to, to panels. We have already some of uh, some questions, some of, some of them. And for example, we have a question from Doug Smith, who is uh, wondering whether how much of the NIO scale come from the first season? And also, have you assessed the years two to eight? Interesting question. We can go back um, to the respective plot, which uh, for NAO is here. In fact, for the years, um, so we, we haven't looked at the time series, but we have found uh, even slightly higher correlation for the NAO in this uh, linear range. So 2 to 8 is, uh, and 2 to 7, they have, um, in, this linear, in this range, we find a, a correlation of 0.63, as pointed in here. More or less, what is interesting to, to notice is that the, the mapping of the skill between the, the Greenland blocking and the NAO is very similar in terms of the lead year range uh, where the skill is found. 
Okay, we have other questions uh, from uh, uh, Ignacio Giuntoli. He's asking, do you have any information on the NIO skill and the influence over the Mediterranean? This has not been assessed for the decadal uh, timescale. Uh, it's an interesting question, of course, and um, I'll, I'll, it's, uh, it's, it's, thank, I, will, I would like to thank for, for the comment. It's something that uh, we may look at later. And thank you. And another question by Antje Weisheimer. Uh, why does the blocking skill increase with the time, especially for European blocking? Why, why the skill increases? Increase with, yeah, with lead time. Yeah. This is um, understood, let's say, from the fact that um, averaging 40 members helps to enhance the signal to noise ratio. The same is the case when we average, when we aggregate different uh, lead, year, lead years. So the more data we put together, the more, uh, the, the, the stronger the signal uh, we, we, we get. So it is, it is, the skill for a single lead year is lower for this reason. And I would like to mention for the, uh, also referring to the previous question that um, the assessment of the NAO, for the skill for the NAO has been done for the seasonal time scale in, uh, in another study, but uh, along the same lines, uh, we would like to do that for the decadal uh, time scale. Okay, thank you. I would also have a question for you, Panos, and you mentioned that uh, you have said the, the, the scale um, against the U2D and SAP and career analysis. Uh, but as you know, there are differences um, in the different reanalysis, even in terms of uh, um, simple variables like the two meter temperature. So do you think that there is also the need to try and do assessment in the for the different reanalysis? This is another interesting question, probably for for the epoch that we are considering. So, which is uh, after the 1950s, there is plenty of uh, data assimilated uh, in in all reanalysis, and uh, we don't expect significant differences. We have seen, we have analyzed this also in the in. Uh, I had the chance to look at this uh, question at this in uh, in analysis that we have done for another project in Primavera, we have seen very small differences uh, between uh, NSAP uh, reanalysis and uh, ERA. For the same period, of course, because one needs to consider when you do this comparison, you need to look at the same historical period. So if you take ERA interim, you're limited to 79 onwards. So if we want to use another reanalysis, we need to use ERA 40 or uh, the Japanese reanalysis. Uh, this is something that can be, it is probably worth doing. Okay, we have a very quick technical question by Xting Yang that uh, she is um, asking whether you have removed the trend before calculating the ACC? No, here we have not removed the trend. Uh, we, this is, something that has been done in uh, in other assessments. I have a slide uh, that I can show you, for example, here in a, in a study that um, we did with uh, Alessio, we assessed uh, how the skill uh, is, uh, changes after detrending the time series, but we haven't, we haven't done this kind of uh, assessment here. Um, if, we, if we look at the time series, you know, we, we can see that there is no significant trend to, to remove. I mean, there is, uh, there is a multi-decadal signal, but I, will, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't try to remove a trend from this time series. And Thank you for the question, though. It's very interesting point. And um, another question back to the NIO. 
uh, Steve by Doug Smith, and he is asking if you have calculated the ratio of predictable components for the NIO, as he's assuming that the signal to, to noise ratio is too small. Is this correct? is very, I believe it is very much so. We have not assessed this uh, quantitatively, but it's, a, uh, it's an important uh, aspect uh, of uh, seasonal and decadal predictions. Here it's the case too. We have a low, a low predictable signal and we need many members. Uh, just because of this, we need a, we need a very large ensemble to, 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 to see the, the response uh, in the atmosphere. So this is something that uh, can, can also be done in this, in this work. Thank you very much. And so I want um, I have another comment, if you want Panos to comment. You, at the beginning of your talk, you uh, said something about the role of the ocean in uh, giving um, predictability to the, to the system. And do you want to comment about the role of other components of the system, like, for example, the land surface? So do you expect that improvement in those aspects will still give more improvement in the scales of prediction of this uh, phenomena? Yes, thank you, Annalisa. Practically, considering the NAO and considering different time scales, maybe I can go quickly and look at this. I have a plot. Okay, I have a plot here that we can refer to. For the for the seasonal scale we see for NAO, we understand that there are different processes that contribute to this skill, and part of this may come from um, snow cover initialization or sea ice from uh, from the ocean from the even from the in, correctly initializing uh, soil moisture particularly for summer but I will argue that for the decadal scale we are much more um, we much more rely uh, on the ocean to to get uh, predictability there is, there is, uh, there is, uh, predictab there is likely some predictability comes from the external forcing, which is uh, indicated by these results here. But I haven't. I mean, it's early to say that we we can uh, assess this, uh, the assess the impact of the of different uh, components. One needs to. Uh, similar works have been done for seasonal forecasts, uh, I, w I can point to specific uh, studies that analyze, for example, what is the impact of non-initializing the, the land of, or soil moisture? Of, what is the impact of initializing one component at a time? So trying to assess, although there are interactions, trying to assess uh, the contribution of, of the, each, each, each uh, different component. These are things to be done for decadal. And, uh, I think decadal forecast and predictions are a bit, I, I step behind. But uh, now we start to see interesting results for atmospheric predictability for the first time. Okay, thank you, Panos. And I think that we can start to close this uh, um, webinar. Uh, next slide, Panos, please. And before closing, I need to advertise the next webinar that will be a joint CMCC FAO. And it will be, it is scheduled for the March the 7th at 12 p.m. And the title is Coronivia Joint Work on Agriculture, Views from Parties and Observers on Topic 2A. And the speaker will be Maria Vincenza Kiriako from CMCC. And next slide, Panos, please. And so I want to thank you again for attending this CMCC webinar. Thank you for the questions raised and for the, the interest in the topic. Thank you, Panos, for uh, your very interesting uh, talk. And I want just to remind that the webinar has been recorded and it will be uploaded on CMCC YouTube channel and on the CMCC website. And also the questions raised will be sent to panels, so we will be able eventually to 
give um, more details on the answer or to answer the questions that have not been uh, asked because of time. And yes, so, I would be happy to do so. Yeah. So thank you again to everyone and um, have a good day and bye. Thank you very much, everybody.